As you open your bulletin to the outline, you can open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, and uh, we're in a series called A Christmas Touch. Now, there are two more messages in this series, and uh, there are some invite cards that are back there. And I would encourage you, because we have the Christmas Eve service mentioned, and we have uh, Christmas Day, one service only on Christmas at 1030, uh, we're not going to ask our volunteers to come early to make coffee and cookies and get the cookies and stuff for Christmas Day because we figure everybody will have plenty Christmas Day, all right? So uh, you can bring your own coffee on Christmas Sunday, but I just thought I'd throw that in uh, so that nobody comes and says, where's my cookies, you know? Um, well, that's the cookie monster not to come to church, uh, at least not here on Christmas Sunday, all right? But seriously invite some people because these cards won't be any good after after christmas sunday all right so they're back there on the back table and you can use uh those for christmas eve and for christmas day one of our folks that is a subscriber to our cd who gets the cds every uh week and is a re is a regular supporter of our ministry said that he likes the big idea uh, that I give in the message and I'm glad that I uh, got that little bit of feedback uh, He found it was useful in helping him to remember uh, The main point of the message and today as we look at touching your family Our big idea is very simply this Christmas is a time to be family Christmas is a time to be Family Now there's no doubt that Christmas can be a time of stress rather than a time of peace. No doubt. Isn't it amazing? Sadly amazing. That sometimes we show the least amount of tolerance during a time that's to be distinguished by peace, right? Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And here's a little irony. Do you know what the best part of Christmas is? It's being together with members of your family. Do you know what the worst part is? It's being together with members of your family. <laughs> that would be funny if it weren't so true, right? And we're all laughing the laughter of identification. Well, we know that Christmas time is family time. And sometimes, of course, there's a lot of stress when it comes to being with family. Those imperfections get magnified and become difficult to digest. And in fact, because of past mistakes in our relationships, the relationships may be more known for anger, heartache, and confusion rather than peace and goodwill. Now, interestingly, those characteristics were something that Joseph experienced as well. He knew all about. I'm talking about the Joseph in the Joseph and Mary story, okay? He knew all about anger and heartache and confusion. So what I want us to do this morning is I want us to look through the lens of Joseph as we talk about Christmas being a time to be family all right matthew chapter 1 verse 18 this is how jesus the messiah was born his mother mary was engaged to be married to joseph but before the marriage took place while she was still a virgin she became pregnant through the power of the holy spirit you see, families often have hard situations, number one in your outline. Families often have hard situations. Joseph found out that his bride-to-be was pregnant. Now, as I was studying and preparing for this message, I was made keenly aware of how far down we've come in our societal mores and norms. And so 
what I need you to do to even help you understand, help, to help you understand what he was experiencing, just think back if you were alive. And this lets out all the younger set. I understand that. But think back to what it was like in American culture. And it wasn't in American culture then even as bad as Mosaic. I understand that. But back 25, 30, 40, 50 years ago, if a girl got pregnant out of wedlock, as they called it back then, just think about the, the shame that there was to the family. Okay? Now, in the Old Testament, under the Mosaic law, if a girl got pregnant during the engagement, it was considered the same as adultery, and both could be put to death, stoned. Now, by New Testament times, they didn't execute, but still was a great, great shame and disgrace, and the person was divorced. So it had to be quite a discouragement to Joseph, to his father. Think about what Joseph's father and mother felt like. Think about what Mary's father and mother felt like. Now, oftentimes when troubles or trials hit our family, we are tempted to think that we are alone in this. That somehow we're experiencing a unique problem because it kind of slams into us and hits us. We think that no one else has problems or troubles like we do. And that's probably because many people find the need to put on the Christianese smile when they go to church and just act like, Everything's fine, super duper, because when people say, how are you? Nobody really wants to know. <laughs> All right. That's what people think. And so we end up living in kind of this bubble where we think, well, I'm the only person that's getting slammed like this. Not true. Not true. Here's a news flash for you. There are no perfect families. There are no perfect families. I'm not knocking you or your family. I'm just trying to help everybody understand something. Everyone has problems or difficulties. Everyone. All of us. The people who sing on the platform, this preacher, okay? Everybody has problems or difficulties. And so families have hard situations. Stop and think about this. God was the only perfect father who ever existed. You ever think about that? In fact, it was interesting because I read both the genealogies in, in Matthew and Luke, and they're somewhat different. But it's interesting that in Luke's, it goes all the way back to Adam, and it says, and Adam was the son of God. Did you ever see that? Notice that in the genealogy? And Adam was the son of God, as it traces back. So Adam literally had God for his father. God was a perfect father, right? How did his kids turn out? And no, no sacrilege is meant here. I'm just trying to help you understand something. They rebelled, they sinned, and they were in a perfect environment. And they still chose to disobey. So all families will have difficulties. And if you have what you think is a perfect family right now, enjoy it. Enjoy it. Because trouble comes to all people. Isn't that what Job said? Man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. You say, well, why is this even helping me then if I'm not having any problems to realize this? Because maybe it'll make you less judgmental. Yeah, less judgmental. 
Jeanette and I used to think that, you know, before we had children in BC, that the only thing wrong with kids was their parents didn't discipline them enough, spank them enough, you know, whatever. <laughs> Sorry. And then God gave us a couple. <laughs> and we learned real quick that that wasn't it. Okay. So why were we so judgmental? Because we weren't very smart, that's why. Because <laughs> we were young and foolish and thought we knew it all, but we had not experienced it. So all families will often have hard situations. Now, the second point is this, fear. Fear often follows hard circumstances or situations. Matthew 1.19, because Mary's husband Joseph was a good man, he did not want to disgrace her in public, so he planned to divorce her secretly. Joseph tempers justice with mercy. We're told that Joseph was a righteous man. His life had been shaped by the transforming touch of God. He was a spiritually sensitive man, committed to doing the right thing in every circumstance. So when he decides what he has to do about Mary's pregnancy, it's his goal to not embarrass or disgrace her. He does not want to hurt her any further. There would be enough hurt as it is. There would be public ridicule and shame. There would be consequences to being pregnant and unmarried. So he has his own solution. And again, remember the time that he lived in, all right? Remember that day. He will move on in his life without Mary, and compassionately he'll break off the pledged marriage and divorce her privately. Now, let's not be too hard on Joseph because he knew. Listen, put yourself in Joseph's shoes. He knew the baby could not be his. They had never slept together. So Joseph knew it wasn't his baby. So then what would he naturally figure? It had to be another man's. And so that fear filled Joseph's heart. And I've often told you this, fear comes from looking at the circumstances that we can see, period. Period, that's it. Fear comes from looking at the circumstances that we can see, see? And, and if you want to put an only in there, at only at the circumstances you can do that and i've given this before the acronym but uh, it bears repeating fear acronym false evidence appearing real you say what do you mean false if i see it it can't be false if it gives you fear then you're looking at the wrong thing you say why, why do you say that because God does not give us the spirit of fear, right? But power and love and a sound mind. 1 Timothy 1 9. So Joseph, and, and he was doing the best he could. He didn't have any new information yet. Joseph is afraid. He's afraid that. Mary has disgraced herself and him. She's been unfaithful to him. He doesn't know what to do. He loves her, so he doesn't want to shame her publicly. And, and in those days, it was a public, public stoning, public shaming. And so his faith is put on trial. Number three. While Joseph thought about these things, Joseph is thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? My mom and dad are upset at me. Her mom and dad are upset. The whole town's going to be mocking us. They lived in Nazareth, small town. Everybody knew. Everybody else's business. 
While Joseph thought about these things, an angel of the Lord, verse 20, came to him in a dream. Now watch. The angel said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid. That's how I know that Joseph was full of fear. The angel said, Joseph, fear not. Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. It's not what it looks like. The baby that is inside of her is from the Holy Spirit of God. Now, imagine having a dream when you're, in effect, told to wake up. You know, Joseph, wake up. You've been drafted. Joseph, hey, got newsflash here from heaven. The angel of the Lord comes to give Joseph the inside information, literally. Now, probably Mary had told him already this, but he found it hard to believe because while Mary had had an angel, the, the angel Gabriel came to her. The angel hadn't come to Joseph. And, you know, what would you think? If somebody told you an angel told me this. And it directly impacted on you negatively. These were circumstances that just had never happened before, that seemed unreal. But Joseph is now learning a valuable lesson that would carry him for a lifetime. Here's the valuable lesson Joseph learned. Never underestimate God. Luke 137, I don't have it on the slide, but you might want to write it down. Because when the angel came to Mary in Luke chapter 1 and told her all about this, and she said, how can this be? The angel said, for with God, it ended the story. The, the angel said, for with God, nothing shall be impossible. Because Mary had said, that, that's not possible. I never heard, they never heard of this before. This can't be. With God, nothing shall be impossible. So Joseph's faith in God's word was put to the test. Would he believe the angel? Would you? How would you know the angel's telling you the truth? Well, what's faith? What is faith? What is faith? Well, Hebrews 11 tells us, doesn't it? It says in verse 1, a faith is a substance. By the way, substance is real. Did you know, think about that. Substance is real. So faith is reality. Faith is the reality of things hoped for. Faith is the evidence of things that are not seen, unseen, unseen circumstances. That's why the Apostle Paul said we need to walk by faith, not by sight. Now keep your eyes open so you don't stumble and fall, but walk by faith. I'm talking about your physical eyes. Walk by faith. Now, who is the object of your faith? That you better make sure about. And if God is the object of your faith, and your faith is in God and His Word, then you're in good shape. If your faith is in man, well, man can fail you, right? Yeah. With men, things are impossible. Another scripture says, but with God, all things are possible. Number four, it's always a help when we find out what God's greater plan is. It's always helpful when we find God's greater plan. See, that's the information Joseph needed. Matthew 121, the angel told Joseph, and she will bring forth a son. Don't be afraid to take Mary, your wife, because as hard as it is for you to believe, Joseph, the baby that is inside of her comes from God and you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. And all this was done that it might be fulfilled, spoken by the Lord through the prophet saying, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. See, Joseph discovers that he is part of a bigger plan. 
Joseph was told to name this baby Joshua. Now, Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew Joshua. That was a common name with a very powerful meaning. It means salvation. Joseph was to name him Joshua because this son was going to save his people from their sin. There was a group of first graders who got together and decided to write their own version of the nativity. It was more modern than the traditional drama. There were the familiar members of the cast, of course, Joseph the shepherds and an angel propped up in the background, but Mary was nowhere to be seen. Suddenly behind the bales of hay could be heard some loud moans and groans. Evidently, Mary was in labor. This is first graders, remember, okay? Soon the doctor arrived, dressed in a white coat with a stethoscope around his neck. Joseph, with a look of relief on his face, takes the doctor straight to Mary, then starts pacing back and forth. After a few moments, the doctor emerges with a big smile on his face. Congratulations, Joseph, he says. It's a god. <laughs> now, that was the message that the angel was giving Joseph, right? This baby was Emmanuel, the Messiah, God with us. It was the ultimate miracle, so it was time for Joseph to get on board, and he does. And you see, when you find God's greater plan, by the way, you say, what's God's greater plan for me? Romans 8.28 promises it. I can't tell you what it is, but Romans 8.28 promises you God's best. Did you know that? Romans 8.28. I didn't, again, put it on a slide because most of you should have it memorized by now. You always have it memorized to give to somebody else, not yourself. Isn't that the way we are? We like to give Romans 8, 20 to other people. And we know. Now, here's the neat part about we, we memorize it. All things work together for good, and that's the way it says it. But what it literally means in the original is that God, we know that God is working all things together for good. And when, the reason I emphasize that God is working all things together for good is because of this. God's not done yet. Now, we always look at things done, don't we? Say, ah, oh, it's done. You know, that person failed. They, they disobeyed me. They ran away. They hurt me. That, and it's done, right? But, see, God lives in the eternal present, doesn't he? God's the great I am. So there is no future with God. When you and I get to tomorrow, God's there waiting for us. That gives me a lot of comfort. God's with me today, and he's also there tomorrow, ahead of me. God is working all things together for good. To those who love him, to those who are his called ones according to his purposes. So finding God's greater plan, you say, how do I do that? Well, what you have to do is trust God and then obey. Like the old hymn says, trust and obey because there's no other way. That's it. For the Christian, for the child of God, trust and obey. Walk by faith, not by sight. Keep walking and it doesn't matter if sometimes you slip back. You can go three steps forward, two steps backward. Just make sure you keep on moving forward. Don't quit. Don't stop. And if that's the case, then you'll be like Joseph. Faithful obedience and service always follows. When Joseph woke up, he did what the Lord's angel had told him to do. Joseph took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to the son, and Joseph named him Jesus. So Joseph is convinced, his anxiety is gone, and now he has faith in the unbelievable. And so he provides for Mary, regardless of the cost. He chooses to love and understand. He chooses to get married so they'll now live together and share the home, even though the betrothal engagement period would not be up. This would undoubtedly raise the eyebrows of the community. It would be presumed by the busybodies standing on the street corners that Joseph and Mary had been unable to wait sexually through their engagement period. And as I said, Nazareth, Nazareth was a small town, so the gossip would be going wild. The impeccable character of Joseph would be undermined. Nevertheless, he tenderly cared for Mary. 
He decided to love her in these difficult situations, no matter what the stress was that they were facing. Now, I know I told you this story once before, probably five or six years ago, but it bears repeating because of how great it illustrates this family point. Dr. Robertson McQuilkin was for many years the president of Columbia Bible College and Columbia Seminary in South Carolina. For a number of years there, he was well known as a Bible teacher, scholar, and author. When he was in his early 60s, his wife developed Alzheimer's. He could have put her into a facility that would have cared for her very well. Instead, he chose to resign his position and devote his life to caring for her. When questioned about why he would need to do that, his answer was simply, that's what God wants me to do. It was an answer that was a demonstration of a commitment of love for both his wife and his Lord. In the same way, Joseph was also willing to sacrifice his own hopes, dreams, and plans for his life. He would keep his commitment to Mary and to God, sacrificing even his own reputation. And that's a demonstration of love. So Christmas is the time to be family. I didn't say it's a time for family. I said it's a time to be family. That's an important distinction. Many of us are going to spend time looking for just the right gift for someone we care about, whether it's for a spouse or children, parents, or a good friend. The gift will perhaps be a demonstration of our love for them. And many will gather next weekend and spend time with grandparents, uncles, and aunts, and cousins. I mean, like I said at the beginning, what would this most special of holidays be like without extended relatives? Maybe you don't want to answer that. But it's at Christmas that we're reminded of our identity as we celebrate our ancestry. See, we are not isolated persons existing in a vacuum. We belong to those who claim a common name and a common past. God wants us to love our family members even when we feel disappointed or let down by them. Why? Because like Joseph, it's time to be family. The example of Joseph challenges us not to look out for our own interests, but to the interest of those who call us family. We can follow the example of Jesus. Here's the only way to do it. You have to follow Jesus' example and look for ways to love each other. I'd like to read to you now a couple of verses out of Philippians chapter 2 from the message, okay? Modern paraphrase of that scripture. Paul the Apostle says it like this. If you've gotten anything out of, at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in the community of spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be de deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. Philippians 2, 5 to 8. So today is the day to love a family member. Maybe it's a relative that needs your help. Maybe it's somebody in your extended family that we call the church. Whoever this person is, touch them with God's love. I know it's stressful. It's stressful to keep all the family-related plates in the air and spinning. But we, have, we need to try to have patience with those around us, especially the children. Don't let them miss the awe of the season. Touch your family especially those that drive you crazy. So ask God to help you guard your tongue and have selective amnesia to things in the past. Forgive as God has forgiven you. Touch your family. Look out for the interest of others just as Jesus looked out for yours. He set aside the privilege of deity and took on the status of a slave. Let us follow his example and serve others for the glory of his name. If you love Jesus, then you and I need to follow this final scripture. Now may your love abound, Paul said, more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, 
so you may be able to discern what is best, and may you be pure and blameless till the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Let's say the big idea together one last time. Christmas is a time to be family. One more time. Christmas is a time to be family. Let's close with a word of prayer, please. Now, I understand that even in this message, it's difficult for some people because perhaps you feel like you don't have any family. Maybe you live here all by yourself. Maybe you moved from your homeland, hometown, and maybe you don't have any relatives in this area. I understand everybody's situation is different. I know that. I, I got that. And so I'm praying, my prayer for you is, if you have no friends in this area, my prayer for you is that God will bring some people into your life that can be your friend, some Christians, some brothers and sisters in Christ that can help you. Or maybe there's a person that God wants you to befriend who doesn't have anybody else either, and they may need a friend. And perhaps God would lay them upon your heart and say, I want you to try to be family to that person who's lonely at this time of the year. Now, if you're not a member of God's family yet, I invite you to join that family. The Bible says, as many as received him, John 1, 12, to those he gave the power to become the children of God, even to those who believed on his name. You become a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ, like right? repenting of your sins and accepting Jesus as your personal Savior. If you've never done that, it'd be my privilege to help you do it this morning. If you'd like to do that, then I invite you to pray this prayer with me right now. Dear Heavenly Father, just quietly from your heart to God. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to be the Messiah, the Savior. Thank you that he died on the cross after living a sinless life. He died on the cross for my sin. I ask him now to come into my life. Forgive my sin. Make me your child, a member of your family. Help me now to live my life for you and tell others what you've done for me and what you could do for them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer in a minute, God heard you and saved you. With well, our heads still bowed and eyes still closed, if you never did that before, but you did it this morning and prayed with me, would you lift your hand right now as a testimony? And you're saying by that raised hand, yes, I ask the Lord today to save me and make me a member of his family. All right, Christian friend, I wonder if there's someone that God's talking to you about. You'd say, Pastor Bill, pray for me that God will help me to love my family and to love them the way he wants me to. Help me this week to show the love of Christ, maybe to somebody in my neighborhood at work that has no one else. And I know I see, I never see a visitor at their house. I never see anybody come there. And I know they don't have anyone else in this world that I know about. Help me to at least be a friend to that person in some way at this Christmas season. And you'd say, pray for me that I'll do what God tells me to do as it relates to my family and others. Would you lift your hand right now? God's spoken to your heart that way. God bless you. Thank you, Lord, for your patience with us. Thank you that you love us very much. Thank you that you will never forsake us, never leave us. Help us to show your love to people around us that desperately need the love of Christ during this holiday season. Help us to see the best gift we can give anybody is the gospel of good news about Jesus who died to give eternal life. Help us to see that if we can give people that gift of salvation, they'll be eternally grateful for all eternity that we gave them that gift, that we loved them enough and cared enough to make time in our busy schedule to give them a gospel tract, to give them a witness. So help us not to be too busy to think about people who Jesus came and died for. In his name I pray, amen.